cognitive health after cancer or cancer treatment. And these were, these were again, some of the common so-called chemo brain symptoms that we talked about, right? There's challenges that I know many of you have experienced, such as short-term memory being maybe not as optimal or concentration being impaired, multitasking, some people say, is harder than it used to be, or probably the one I hear the most is, you know, there's a tip, there's a word in the tip of my tongue, and I just can't get that word out. Um, and not everyone has every one of these, these symptoms, right? Some people just may struggle with one or two of these areas. Um, but whatever it is, I, I do believe, and I wouldn't be here otherwise, that there are things we can do to optimize our cognitive um, performance. And as I mentioned last time, um, there is no pill, right? There is no single pill. I'm skipping through some of the things we talked about. Yes, I mean, I, I use, and I know other physicians use medications on a case-by-case -case basis, but I, I don't believe any longer that we can rely on just a single medicine to contend with the constellation of symptoms that we deal with. So this is what I and my team has kind of formulated as a roadmap to brain health. And again, we can't talk about all of these things in, in a module like this. So we have a 10-week a program that we run at Cedars to kind of go in depth about how to integrate some of these ideas. So there is, again, mindfulness and mood management approaches. We talked a little bit about that last time. Um, the previous time I was here, I spent a, uh, a few minutes talking about exercise and cognition. I wanna talk about that just for a moment in some more detail. And we talked about sleep last time. And, and then there's cognitive strategies, like there's actually brain exercises to work on attention, memory, problem solving. Um, and again, I'm not gonna get into that today, but there are sometimes speech therapists you can work with or neuropsychologists, or again, we, um, we have some studies available if you're interested at CEDARS that you may qualify for. I'll talk about one of them today. So again, I know I talked about exercise and cognition last time. I'm gonna, uh, I don't wanna revisit this all again. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip through this, but there is one piece of exercise that I didn't focus on that I wanna revisit today. So give me one second just to get queued up for um, where we left off. Okay, so this is a this is a, a slide we talked about last time, and I know it's a medical slide, but I think it's important to understand this basic idea. So I want to revisit this. So one of one of the key ideas is that when our immune system either engages with let's say cancer cells or kind of processes, let's say surgery, chemo, radiation, or all the stress that comes with this process. It produces what we kind of talked about before, the, these cytokines, right? And cytokines is again, it's just a medical word for something we all know, which is these inflammatory compounds. And you might remember we talked about previously, for example, when you have the flu, we all feel tired and we all feel foggy and nobody wants to read a textbook when we have the flu. But we argued that it's not the flu virus itself, it's your immune system response to the flu, right? So your immune system recognizes this foreign bug and it says, okay, I'm gonna produce these so-called cytokines that is gonna make me tired and exhausted and all that. And we argued that, right? Probably your body's doing this to you when you have the flu, so it forces you to rest. And then we kind of made the extension that there's probably an analogous process going on during chemo. So your body receives these drugs. It sees this as kind of something foreign in its midst, and it produces these same cytokines that then, at least in part, we believe drives the cognitive issues, the fatigue, et cetera. Now, what I didn't talk about and draw your attention to last time is if you follow this figure, you'll notice that these cytokines not only seem to be driving cognitive issues, fatigue, and depression. I didn't draw your attention to it last time, but it seems to be associated with 
a higher rate of recurrence or progression. Do you all see that? Now, I hope I made the case in the last module that exercise seems to help cognitive performance after surgery, chemo and radiation and whatnot. I, I hope we established that. But then the question is, if exercise can reduce these cytokines, I think the next logical question then would be, can it actually help our survival in the cancer setting, right? Can it reduce the rate of recurrence and progression for certain cancer types? And I know I'm going off a little tangent, but I think it's so important. I want to, I want to let this sit in front of you for a moment. I'm going to read it. I don't usually like to just read slides, but I want to read this. So it really stays with you. And this is just using breast cancer as the first um, example. 28% reduction in breast cancer specific mortality if you're active versus, let's say, a couch potato. And all cause mortality is down by almost 50% in one study um, looking at breast cancer survivors. Another study found a 41% reduction in breast cancer specific mortality if you're active versus the least active. Now, I want to be as kind of direct and blunt as I can be. I, you know, you, I'll leave it to you. I, I do not believe that these are small negligible numbers, right? 40%, 30%, 50%, whatever the truth actually lies. These are really substantial. Now, I didn't say it brings our risk down to zero, right? Because there is no magic pill that does that. But at least for breast cancer, these studies have shown that there's a credible and meaningful reduction. There was another study, this is called a meta-analysis, and I'll give you the gist of it because I know it's a kind of a complicated graphic, but they looked at a number of individual studies in men and women in different cancer types. And I, I kind of bolded boxed in red, the kind of the bottom line. So CRF stands for cardiorespiratory fitness, which is a marker of our, our overall fitness levels. And what they basically showed is if you're high fit compared to low fit, your overall cancer mortality is almost cut in half, 0.55. Again, not these are not negligible numbers. This is just an average of all these smaller studies. And there's been numerous of us studies since then. So as I conclude this exercise part of this story, I, I want to again reiterate, there's reasonable evidence that exercise helps with chemo brain symptoms. And at least for many cancer types, including breast cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer, probably others, there needs to be more research. It may help with survival itself. So um, that is that is the kind of the end of the exercise story for now. Okay, uh, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. So we're just talking about exercise, which I think is important, but this is also gaining much more attention in, in my opinion, and I'm, and I'm gonna um, ask you to think about this. So the question you see before you is what increases the risk of death as much as smoking cigarettes and more than inactivity, we're just talking about how important activity is, or, or more than obesity. You kind of just imagine your answer in your own mind. Usually the answers I get are, I don't know if anyone has anything in the chat, but usually I hear, you know, stress or depression or anxiety. And I'm not saying that these things don't have its own health risks, but the research is a little bit complicated because it's all about how you interpret those things. But the answer that seems to be clear cut is chronic loneliness. Where we know chronic loneliness can change how our heart works, our immune system works, our nervous systems work. We're going to talk about why, because it may not seem obvious to us. Like, why would loneliness be so hazardous compared to? All these other things you see, oh, this slide might be hard to see, but let me just walk you through this. So this is looking on the x-axis, the impact on our survival 
from different lifestyle factors that we already knew related to our overall survival. So for example, you know, the first thing you see down here is being obese, let's say. And you could see how much of a weighted impact it has on survival, right? And right above that is physical activity. You could see it has a little bit more than obesity. And here is like excessive alcohol drinking, more than six a day. You could see it has even more of an impact. Now, what you see here is smoking 15 cigarettes a day. You could see how much of an impact it has. And just above it, it seems that having low social support compared to high has even an equivalent or higher impact than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And that's where you've all heard this probably in the lay news, right? I, I imagine that chronic social isolation is equivalent to smoking about 15 cigarettes a day. This is astounding. And we'll, we'll talk about why, because I think it's important to understand the reasons behind this. But why am I talking about this in a chemo brain type lecture? And the reality is in the, in the general population, loneliness is a risk factor for poor over cognitive performance, faster cognitive decline, poor executive function. And we've published a study and, and, and has a, another group that it seems to be a risk factor, loneliness, for cognitive symptoms uh, after, after cancer treatment. And then the question is why? And I, I, don't, I don't have a slide for this now, but let me explain this in my own words, and maybe this will hopefully stay with you. So let's say imaginarily a million years ago or 100,000 years ago, you were isolated all alone in the forest, right? Away from your tribe, away from your village. One theory is, is that that isolated individual would have these inflammatory compounds markedly produced in the forest if you're alone. Why? It's there to protect you, right? Because if you're all alone and you don't have the protection of your tribe and your community or village, that you might be, for example, more vulnerable to a predator attack, right? A lion may attack you because you're all alone. And if I have a higher chance of being attacked by a lion, I want those inflammatory cells ready and active and ready to go. So if I, if I get clawed in the arm, I have those inflammatory compounds ready to rush to my arm and help me heal from that wound. So your body is doing what it can to protect you. It's not, it's not there to harm us, but we're in a different environment where if I'm alone today, I'm not going to get bitten by a lion, but those same mechanisms are at play. So what was meant to hurt us in the, excuse me, help us in the short term, when it goes unchecked for years and years at end, it may be potentially harmful. And I want to emphasize another point, which is important. Loneliness and isolation are not the same thing. One may lead to another, but they're not necessarily the same. And the reason this is important is because we all know people, for example, who are married, for example, or maybe even have lots of pe people around them, but they may feel deeply lonely. Or the other way around, we may people, we know all know people who li live alone, for example, but they just feel connected to an aunt, a cousin, a neighbor, a friend, and they feel, you know, they have a meaningful connection. That's all it need, you need to feel to keep from feeling lonely. So yes, it tends to kind of connect with each other, but ultimately loneliness is a subjective experience, right? Some people are isolated, but not lonely. And other people are lonely, even with lots of social contacts. You may have 850 Facebook friends and feel very lonely, or for some people, maybe Facebook is a great way to stay connected and, and avoid isolation. It really can go either way. The reason I bring this up again in this kind of program is, you know, this we're doing this to the cancer support community, right? That one of the great benefits of having these kind of organizations 
is it's a way to stay connected, to know that we're not going through this all alone. And I wouldn't bring up the potential health risks of loneliness. And, and I didn't really spell this out, but loneliness has been linked to higher rates of heart disease, higher rates of infections, higher rates of dementia, I kind of already alluded to. And I, and I didn't say this, but it's been associated with a higher rate of recurrence for certain cancers like breast and ovarian cancer. I wouldn't bring up all of these negative uh, concerning studies if I felt like it's not something we could overcome. And one of the ways we can overcome this is just by paying attention. So, so some of us just hearing this will say, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't realize this was so important. I'm gonna invest a little bit more energy, a little bit more time to kind of stay connected with the people that mean the most in my life. And believe me, believe me, I know it's an election year. I know it's a divided world. And I know people are bickering and arguing about all kinds of things. But I guess what I'm here to say is even though relationships are complicated and they take energy, what I believe the science has clearly told us is that it's worth the investment, at least for a small handful of people to feel like we have some kind of meaningful relationship amongst our midst. Now, I know for some of us, these patterns of isolation may have played out for so long, complicating things, of course, were the pandemic, that sometimes we may need the help of a of a therapist to employ cognitive behavioral therapy because there may be people around us, but we need to reinterpret how we're experiencing these relationships in a more positive way. And so CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, can be can be quite helpful for some. But I want to share a quote by one of the scientists that did a lot of this loneliness research. And, and, and you know, this was an, from an interview that I pulled this quote from, and he was kind of noticing and he was publishing on this idea again that social connection could help with heart disease and maybe cancer and cancer types and and our cognitive function and brain functioning and immune function and on and on and on and our happiness right too and he noted you know it's not like you have to take a pill or have a surgery so on one hand he said I'll, I'll quote him he said the degree of social connection that can improve our health and happiness is both as simple and as difficult as being open and available to others. So there's this magic pill and it seems easy, but it seems so elusive to us these days. The, 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 the United Kingdom, England has a ministry of loneliness. This is before the pandemic. I think it was in 2018. Because believe it or not, this is not just an American phenomenon. It seems to be more prevalent across the West with how we have designed our societies. But there's a ministry of loneliness to contend with the very serious issues with isolation and loneliness that are that's occurring in the United Kingdom as well. So um, not an easy topic to grapple with, but I think an important one and one that we still have within our domain of control we still have some agency but again it it takes it takes some attention and we have to kind of nurture that that part of our humanity so what you have here before you is an overview of the program that we run at cedars emerging from the haze this is a 10 week workshop and again i've just been able to give you a little glimpse um, it's about an hour per module, again, where we talk about sleep and exercise in more detail and memory strategies and attention strategies and problem solving um, and ne managing negative thinking patterns and, and kind of some of the themes about social support that we talked about. And then I know some people may wonder, well, why do we have to spend a whole hour a week for 10 weeks? That's 10 hours on these things. Can't you just give us a one pager and say, get exercise, get good sleep, you know, eat this kind of healthy diet, you know, here, here's a link to some memory exercise. Why, why, why do we need so much of the why to exercise, on the why to sleep, on why social support is so important? And, 
And I think the answer was summarized very succinctly to me by Nietzsche over a hundred years ago, right? And, and I know many of you have heard this. Um, he wrote, he who has a why to live for it can bear almost any house. And this always stayed with me because yes, I could spend 20 seconds and, and, and just tell you get 150 minutes of exercise, but you tell me if I'm wrong, if you understood the why and how it could reduce cancer recurrence and improve cognitive function and improve our functioning and maybe help with lymphedema, and you understand the science of how it did that. We talked about this in the previous module on how it produces when you contract your muscle of these myokines and myokines reduce these cytokines and you understand the intricate, elegant biology. I, I personally believe that if we understand the why, we'll figure out how to get the exercise in. If we understand the why on, on why social support is so important and really understood why and on how it impacts our biology, I believe the, we'll figure out the high. Many, many have argued that when we have a problem, 90% of the attention should be on understanding the why and then the rest of it, the how, because we'll, our brains will figure out how to get it done if we really have a compelling reason within our minds. And so that's why the program is 10 hours and not just 10 minutes, even though we could probably give you, you know, the how in just 10 or 15 minutes. For... Okay, now I, I wanna share a quote by one person who completed the program. Uh, and this was a number of years ago. And I remember when she when she started the program, this is where we're just starting the program again a decade ago. And she was a psychologist at UCLA. And I was really nervous when I heard we were going to have a psychologist because I thought, you know, what in the world do we have to teach a psychologist? You know, she already probably knows everything. Um, and she shared these words with us and she allowed us to share it with subsequent groups. And, I, and the reason I share these words is these were her words, not to me, but to cancer survivors who who are contending with chemo brain type symptoms. And I, I want to read this to you. Here's what she said. She said, be resilient. If you find you have some nagging cognitive problems after the intense treatment phase is complete, it's a setback, but be flexible and persevere. Be proactive. It's not realistic for oncologists or surgeons to be responsible for this transitional stage of your care. They simply do not have the time or expertise. Accept that there will be a transitional stage of rehabilitation during which there is a lot we can do to influence our internal biology, educate ourselves, and to seek professional help from the field of rehab medicine and neuropsychology to make a huge difference in the level of functioning we attain. These are core healthcare issues, not optional or ancillary ones. And she went on to say, to develop an observing ego and keep moving forward. Find a viewpoint from which you can observe yourself again and how you interact with the world you live in. From this, you will see choices, options for being in control again. Use your brain, learn something fun that revitalizes you rather than drains you. I no longer believe I will be returning to my previous life. I think the landscape has changed forever. I am going forward in new directions, still on a magnificent journey. So those words that she shared really stayed with me. And, and that's, that's why I share it with you because I think what she's really reminding all of us is, yes, it, and, I, and I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but I agree with her. It may not be the same life, but I think she's offering this promise that it could still be a wonderful life and we can still learn new strategies and ways of taking control and having a sense of agency again. 
So that's um, a really high level overview on our um, cognitive rehab program emerging from the haze. I just tried to give you a few snippets that I hope might be helpful in your own recovery. Um, before I sign off, I want to, for those of you that might live near the Cedar sinai area, I want to um, share a study that we're about to open, if you're interested. This is a study of um, light therapy known as photobiomodulation for, for again, for these um, chemo brain cancer-related cognitive symptoms. Um, if you are over the ages of 18, or if you had stage one through three um, solid tumor like breast cancer, colon cancer, um, prostate cancer, et cetera, Hodgkin's or non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and you finished your active treatment at least six months ago, but not more than five years ago, um, you could be eligible for the study. So the way the study works, and I'm gonna go through it, is you would basically come to our clinic if you're eligible, and this is a kind of a info, you know, just a cartoon graphic, but you wear this helmet that emits this wavelength of light for, 10, for, for basically 10 minutes. And you do this three times a week for six weeks. So light therapy, is non-invasive um, and, and it's been already used for a number of conditions related to like pain and lymphedema and, and um, mucositis like mouth sores from let's say chemotherapy. And there's some evidence that it might be helpful for cognitive functioning for older adults. There's some evidence that it might help for depression and traumatic brain injury patients, but there's been no studies for again, chemo brain. And so this is what the actual device looks like. It's not um, so far-fetched. Um, it, it's, again, this helmet, uh, uh, again, that has not been studied for chemo brain. So the way we're running the study, it's, it's a randomized study. The catch is, if, if you qualified and if you entered the study, there's a 50% chance that you get the actual therapeutic light or what we think might be therapeutic or there's a 50% chance you get fake light. You just get an artificial light that doesn't, that's not expected to do anything. That would be the placebo group. Um, there is some reimbursement um, for, you know, modest for, for your time. But if you think you might be interested, um, by, feel free to um, send me an email. I'll be happy to have our research coordinator contact you. It's not open yet, but we, we think it will be open within a month or so. Um, and, and I just want to share that again, if you happen to live not too far from the Cedars area, thank you all so much for your attention and the opportunity to be with you. I'll be happy to take.